Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Matthew Gibb, for those that don't know who I am. Uh, I am very, very privileged to be one of five deputy executives uh, here in Oakland County, serving to the benefit, I'm gonna use one of these instead. It might be better. That might be better, very good. You're right, it wasn't loud enough. So I'm Matthew Gibb. I'm very privileged as our co-chairs are making their way up to the front. Uh, the general, of course, our guest speaker today, and the man of uh, the hour, Brooks Patterson, is making his way up to the front. I'm very privileged to be one of five deputy executives. I would recognize, I did see Phil Bertolini, uh, who just won public official of the year in Washington, D.C., and I wanted to recognize that. I think Phil is here somewhere. <laughs> Phil? I did see him. Maybe he's not standing up. So, But we recognize Phil, and I think I saw Jerry Poison as well. Uh, and part of the team, Jerry's in the back. And so the whole team's here. Uh, Bob Datto is here and the rest, Malcolm Brown. So we are very privileged to be deputy county executives to uh, a very fine young man. Uh, he's been uh, doing quite well these days and running a county second to none. Our budget is balanced. Uh, we are celebrating some milestones, which I will go through for the round table um, as we go forward into the future. And to start our meeting and to welcome us all, Brooks Patterson, deputy, or <laughs> deputy, shoot. I just got fired again, darn it. <laughs> Our county executive. This one is? Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be coughing in your face all morning. I apologize. <coughs> this is the sixth week of this call. Be an old friend. Um, but thank you for coming out early uh, on a weekday. I'm always amazed uh, by the number of citizens um, Oakland County residents who take time out of their schedule to work for basically the county. Uh, biggest committee I think we have. Uh, we have Ainge Street, which is a big economic development corporation. Uh, just Anyway, oh, that's much better. Um, so we got just a, a boatload of uh, committees staffed by the public, which allows us to take on more and more challenges because I've got the staff to see the program through. My uh, great artist is another one. It, it just goes on and on. And uh, so I'm very, very pleased to have all of you here this morning. And because, uh, you know, this is our 25th anniversary. For 25 years, um, it's, uh, it's you know, it takes its toll, runs its course. And if you look over here on the tripods, you will see something close to uh, 800 recommendations that the Business Roundtable has sent to me as county exec in ways we can work to improve our economy. And hopefully, uh, when we do, that improves. Uh, the bottom line for you. That's what it's all about, of course. Um, we're going to recognize five people, actually six, who've been with us since uh, day one, 20, a full 25 years. And I think that's a Herculean commitment on the part of these um, individuals who are here. I hope they're all here this morning. Um, but they, they've been on this business roundtable since its inception. It was a promise I had made to the voters when I was campaigning back in uh, 92. Can you believe that? Whoa, I had to stop and think. Um, so I'm going to recognize these five before we get any further into the program. I, I don't know if they're here. I haven't had a chance to talk to the committee, but Herb Hipple, you here? Herb, yeah, please, come, please come forward. Linda Jolliker. On up, Linda. Um, Alan Kerlick. I saw Alan earlier. I know he's here. There he is. And uh, Fred Seeley. Where's Fred? Right there. Come on up, Fred. And unfortunately, Terry Adderley, who's the uh, chairman of the Workforce Education Committee, formerly a co-chairman of this uh, August committee. It's not here, but Al Sowers from uh, Services. Al, come on up. 
Um, oh. Somebody has already given up. Gene Chamberlain, don't get away. Gene Chamberlain was on the round table in the beginning as a staff member of mine. And uh, when she left my staff and retired, we kept her on the business round table because she is really a hard worker and knows so many people that uh, we need to interact with. So, Gene, we have a plaque for you as well. <laughs> Let's give uh, all six a, a round of applause and thank you very much, everybody, for your support. Would you please tell Terry he was missed? Okay, I'm talking Al Sowers behind you. Would you please tell? Um, to keep the meeting on schedule and moving, I've got a, a few more pages that were typed up by my industrious staff, which I will hereby skip. And uh, Matt, back up. Matt, and uh, send to the meeting as such. Thanks, Brooks. We got your spot right here. So when I told Brooks that we were changing venues, he said, well, will anybody know where to go because everybody's gone to the same spot for so many years. And so thank you for finding this beautiful building. So who has been here to the Student and Community Center at Baker College before and even knew that this beautiful facility existed? Pam, you don't count. You've been here before. So some Auburn Hills folks have been here. Not too many, right? So to give us some brief remarks and to welcome us to this uh, wonderful uh, college and uh, to this wonderful space, uh, Pete Karsten. Uh, president of Baker College. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? We're going to keep doing mic checks this morning, make sure we can uh, get the volumes correct. Uh, but my name is Pete Carson. I am the campus president here at the Auburn Hills campus. And on behalf of all of our faculty and staff, let me welcome you. We are so pleased to have you here this morning. Let me certainly say thanks, of course, to Brooks and to Matt and to the staff uh, at Oakland County for selecting uh, Auburn Hills for this business round meeting. We are, we are very pleased to have you here, of course. Uh, we host many events like this, uh, so we would certainly like to uh, host your event. If you have a meeting of this size or a training session that would require a smaller classroom, I would encourage you to reach out to myself. Or let me briefly introduce Meredith O'Conquer. Meredith is on our staff here, and she's our employer relations specialist who works with our employers in our outreach. But contact either Meredith or myself either today or at any point after the meeting if we can assist you in some way in, in having an event like this. I want to give you two takeaways uh, before I get on with this wonderful program today. One is I want you to look around and list, uh, if you haven't been to the Baker College campus before, understand that we are the largest nonprofit uh, independent college in the state of Michigan with over 15,000 students across nine campuses offering certificate to doctoral degrees with one goal. We don't measure by wins and losses. We don't measure by bowl selections. We measure by the employment of our students. And we've been doing that for 106 years. We've been doing it since 1992 at this particular building. So 25 years here in, uh, here in Auburn Hills and have been very pleased to serve this community and look forward to doing it. And the second takeaway, of course, is a little gift that we want you to take uh, on behalf of, of Baker College and our Culinary Institute in Port Huron. Our students, under the direction of our award-winning culinary faculty, have made some chocolates. And we certainly are, are pleased to be able to provide you with that gift uh, as you leave today, whether or not you consume it now, uh, you consume it later, or, or give it to somebody else in your life uh, if you're watching those calories during this holiday season. But enjoy that, certainly, on behalf of, of Baker College. And I will turn the program over, of course, back to Matt, and thank everyone for being here today. Thank you, Pete. And, uh, you know, for those that don't know, Baker College is uh, one of you know, the, the, the mixture of schools that we have in Oakland County that does such a valuable job in our workforce development. And uh, we thank you, Pete, and your staff, and uh, all of your professors and teachers that are doing that work. Uh, Russ Shelton has been uh, part of the roundtable for years and years. He sat as co-chair for the economic development community for a long time, uh, and, and now sits as our co-chair of the roundtable. Russ told me, kind of in the middle of the year, he says, well, 
trying to figure out what this co-chair does, and what this co-chair does is really represent us well in the public and at the annual meeting gives a few remarks. Uh, Russ Shelton. Thank you. Good morning. I know if I didn't take the uh, mic from Matt, I'd be in a lot of trouble to start telling stories. Yes, I have been on the round table a number of years, like we're trying to figure it out. It uh, actually seems like forever, but it, it's been a great experience. I know we're not done yet. We have a lot of ideas every year. We bubble them the top, we come talk to Brooks and see what he likes and doesn't like, and then we move forward. And uh, I believe there is a running total of the number of recommendations that actually have been advocated over the years. I believe it's in the 130s or so, if I'm not mistaken. That, uh, but 82% of what we do all year long actually gets advocated. And that's a, that's a hell of a job, really. But it's a great group. Um, I've been mostly involved with the Economic Development Group. It's one of the larger groups. Uh, Mr. Cooper gets to handle that, and I say he does a great job keeping all the puppies in a box. So we tend to wander off and kind of have our own little side means he pulls us back together, but that's okay. But, uh, you know, Brooks is an amazing guy. I don't think I need to tell you all that, but he keeps coming up with new ideas. Well, let's do this, let's do that. I mean, I don't know if he ever sleeps, but he's always thinking, that's for sure. And uh, I, I enjoy being part of this committee. Thank you. So, uh, usually we give a update of the recommendations that have been posed by the committees annually. Now, last year we changed that a little bit. Uh, we changed it so that as we conclude with our keynote speaker, which we'll have in just a moment, that we have an opportunity for a round table. So those that weren't here last year, uh, it means that um, I kind of work the room a little bit, which means I might call on you, Alan, or Anthony, or some of these. So, you know, get your questions ready. Be thinking all about that. And we're going to go through the recommendations and the work of the five committees as part of that round table discussion. But just to kind of give you a general overview of, of kind of where the county's at, uh, what we'll be working on in the year to come. We've got some really exciting things that have happened just within the last few weeks. Uh, one comes out of our workforce development. You know, our workforce and education committee has long sought a, a continuing drumbeat of recommendation of skilled trades training and allowing for other opportunities to enhance training opportunities within the county. Uh, Jennifer Llewellyn, who is here, who is our manager of workforce development and runs our eight Michigan work centers, um, not admirably, but expertly uh, throughout the county, recognized in the state really as the best uh, Michigan works uh, uh, county uh, or agency in, in the state of Michigan, uh, took 99 applications up to the state of Michigan and we were awarded 86 of those applications in skilled worker training funds to the tune of over $2.1 million of training. That will result in, in almost 3,000 or more than 3,000 workers being trained and retrained within Oakland County in 46 new apprenticeships. And so when you think of the work of the Workforce Development Committee, I think that deserves a round of applause, Jennifer. That was a great job. So as you think of what the Workforce and Education Committee is doing, they're doing the things that are making the energy and the, the recommendations around events like that happening, giving Jennifer the backing and the resources uh, and the support that she would need from all of the work that you're doing. The Transportation Committee is not without its uh, work. Uh, Alan Kerlick and, and, and Doug Smith have run a, a great committee this year. They focused on things like safety and how do we create better pedestrian safety for people that are out and about our county. You know, it's not all about automobiles and hospitals. Sometimes it's about trails, it's about bicyclists, it's about pedestrians that were there in the community. It's that overlap between transportation and quality of life. But I'm pleased to announce that one of the things that they've pushed on is connected mobility and transportation. Many of you know that Oakland County has been working in connected mobility now um, for just over three years. Brooks, being the visionary he is, gave us the task at a state of the county just over three years ago that said, I would like Oakland County to be the first county to have a connected infrastructure system that we can really benefit our, our, our business community and our economic sustainability. Uh, just last week, we have finally issued the RFP, the request for proposal that will design a pilot system that will monetize a connected mobility infrastructure within Oakland County. We've issued that RFP directly to about 120 companies, but it's already been out to more than 20,000 companies worldwide. My email inbox, I don't think, can handle the traffic 
uh, which is a great thing. We are putting ourselves not only on the map for connected mobility, but we are kind of setting the stage for those around the country that might follow our lead. Uh, that comes from the great support and work of the Transportation Committee when they talk about the importance of integrating mobility. And I know uh, Dennis Kolar is here and Eric Wilson and Ron from the Road Commission. Our partnership with the Road Commission for Oakland County is essential to us succeeding in that, in that realm. The Quality of Life Committee, of course, continues to push forward on we don't really sell things uh, to businesses around the world unless we have a great place for them. And so the Quality of Life Committee continues to push forward. The work of economic development, though, really overlaps with a lot of those things. You know, our Tech 248 initiative is going very, very strong. We have almost 1,000 members now within our Tech 248 network. And if you don't know what Tech 248 is, if it hasn't touched one of your communities, Tech 248 really represents the 2,400 plus advanced technology companies we have in IT in Oakland County. So those 2,400 companies represent about 60% of the total in Southeast Michigan. And so Oakland County really leads the way. Tech 248, led by Greg Doyle in the Business Center with the support of Irene and others, brings those C-level people together. They have meetups, uh, and about every month, every six weeks or so, they have a meetup where C-level people come together. The next generation of that going forward next year will be we want to create hotspots. People want us to compete against Silicon Valley. And matter of fact, I heard Brooks Patterson say that a few times when he created Automation Alley and other in instances. The recommendations that you see around the room represent nearly 800 recommendations. You'll find recommendations, and we're searching for them right now, to tie, well, when did this business roundtable recommend that we should have a greater communication with our technology companies? There's recommendations from this roundtable that direct us to do that. When did this roundtable say that we need to have a greater uh, pitch, a greater understanding of the strength of how many engineers and how much automation and how much advanced robotics we have here? That came as a part of the recommendation of the business roundtable. Yes, of course, Brooks, the visionary that he is, created Automation Alley. He helped us to create Tech 248, the monikers, the, 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 the life around all of that. But those suggestions and recommendations come out of the work of this roundtable. And so we thank you heartily for that. As we go forward in the next year from an economic development perspective, we've got a lot of milestones we're about to hit. Uh, we'll probably have another party. And there, you all know what I mean when I say we're about to hit a milestone and have another party. Every time we hit a milestone in emerging sectors, Brooks says, let's celebrate the businesses that got us there. And so we've been on the floor of the palace and we've been in the hangar at Pentastar. Um, and arguably, by the December report, we will pass $5 billion in investment in emerging sectors. We brought in this year close to $1 billion. Yeah, that's a good applause factor, right? Just in this year alone, we have closed in emerging sectors close to $1 billion of investment just in that program. I remember Brooks said years ago, somewhat as a result of his own vision, but a lot of the work of this business roundtable and the recommendations diversify ourselves so we're not so dependent on the automobile. We are clearly the automotive capital of the world, more so than Detroit or Dearborn or anywhere else. And that's not a disparagement to my friends that have shown up from somewhere else outside of the county. We have 75 of the top 100 tier one automotive companies here. We have more than 375 R&D centers in automotive. We clearly are the capital of where that automobile is being invented, but Brooks was visionary and said diversify ourselves. Nanotechnologies, robotics, life science, insurance, defense, those categories of emerging sectors just in one year alone has resulted in nearly a billion dollars of investment. What will that bring for the coming year? Us coming to all of you and saying, what's Emerging Sectors 2.0 look like. I know Automation Alley is working on Industry 4.0, and I would encourage you to, to look at what that is, but what does Emerging Sectors 2.0 look for us? What are those advanced technologies that we should be working on? Um, Irene Spanos, Dan, Director, uh, Dan Hunter, our Deputy Director, certainly need uh, ideas. They've got their own, I'm sure. Irene's looking at me like, why are you picking on me? Uh, but the ideas that you would bring in the coming year from the roundtable on what is the next generation of technology? We know some things that are out there. Advanced mobility, autonomous driving, telehealth. Those types of issues are intertwined with our existing emerging sectors. And so we look at what will the next five billion be? It'll all land in Auburn Hills, right, Tom? So what will the next five billion be? Uh, and need your help in that. So the roundtable is integral to the work that we do. You're going to hear after we get into the next session of, of the panel discussion, some of the questions that I will have is, what does this August group look like in the years to come? 25 years. Brooks started this with the idea of, I need the business community to come together. That first year, they had like 14 committees. They made more than 140 recommendations that first year. 
Since then, 25 years, almost 800 recommendations. What will this look like in the years to come? What will it look like next year and the year after? If you look around, do we have a representation of the Anthony Grappitos of the world? Anthony's doing such a great job in suicide prevention work, and, and he's a magician as well. And, and how do we get Anthony's voice in the round table? We look around and we say, how do we get the vector forms and the companies that are doing the advanced technologies that are so robust in the county to be more engaged with the dialogue of this very, very important group for Oakland County? So we'll be talking about that. What do we look like in the years to come? What does this group look like? Do the committees stay the same? And the chairs have been talking about that, and I'm giving them a little precursor to what our panel discussion will be about um, as we go forward. So with that, a perspective. Oh, sure, Brooks. I go back to the office. I want to make sure that Matt gets a raise because he used Brooks and Visionary over 15 times in the same <laughs> position. M making up for calling you a deputy executive earlier, I guess. So enough of me. Of course, you guys hear from me a lot. So uh, before you leave, check out some of the boards. You know, Pam does such a great job of designing and creating and laying out. I was saying, just blow up the, power, the, the, the Excel spreadsheet and put it on a foam core. And she's like, no, Matt, it's got to look a little better than that. So check it out. This is the work that you've done over those 25 years. Those that have been here for 25 years, Gene and others, congratulations. Every year we have a keynote. Sometimes they've been as good as Mickey Redmond showing a video of Red Wings highlights. Um, that was Steve Huber's idea. Um, no, I'm kidding, Steve. Uh, sometimes they've been as, as great as, uh, as Mr. Bertolini from Aetna. Um, I believe this year's keynote is going to be equally as great. We're very, very pleased um, that General Slocum from the Salford Air Force Base has joined us today. He said, don't give me a lengthy bio. His bio or introduction, his bio is in the program today. You can certainly read his great accomplishments. The one that I like the most is he spent 4,000 hours um, in a fighter jet. Uh, and that's pretty cool to me. And I like, you know, men that went through the ROTC and had a bachelor's degree in political science and now is hitting up one of the most important assets uh, in our armed services, certainly in Michigan, but arguably in the entire Midwest, uh, if not the country. So to give us his remarks and reflections on where they're at and hopefully a little bit about that F-35 project that's happening uh, in Selfridge, we're crossing our fingers soon. General Slocum. Uh, I'm General Slocum, and I am the commander of your Michigan hometown Air Force. When I started this job, according to Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, each state is required to keep a militia. It's in the Constitution. I showed up at a meeting one time when I first moved here to Michigan, and I walked in, and I sat in front of a group like this, and I said, we are the Macomb Militia. Public Affairs walked up to me, and she goes, there is a Macomb militia, they're not very good people, and don't ever say that again. <laughs> but now we're your hometown Air Force. That sounds a lot better, doesn't it? Uh, you know, that was just a video, just a, a small section of what goes on out at Selfridge Air National Guard Base. And that was from 2015, a deployment from just one of our mission sets, which is our A-10 attack aircraft. Um, you know, sort of motivational to see what happens, but they're absolutely amazing men and women that serve as part of your hometown Air Force. And that's what I'm here to talk with you a little bit about today. Uh, the asset that is Selfridge Air National Guard Base and the wonderful men and women who make up your hometown Air Force. Now, just for the record, I heard a lot of you chuckle when you saw that up there in the little list of all the stuff on the bottom. One cow, for the record, that was an ISIS cow. All right? Um, but it's great to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you a little bit. Let me just tell you a little bit about Selfridge. But I'm going to tie all this into what you all do here, because all the different aspects, things that we're talking about, economic development, why does Selfridge matter to you from an economic standpoint? From a workforce development, how does what we do out there tie into you here in Oakland County? Um, workforce development, how do we develop leaders? How do we develop workers? How do we get the talent that we need to have? And there's a lot of common equities, as you're going to see as I walk through here a little bit, that I hope uh, directly addresses what the types of things you're looking at here as part of this Oakland Roundtable. Begin with, Selfridge was established in 1917. Uh, Henry Packard basically uh, gave some land to the government to start uh, what became, I'm sorry, Joy Field, Henry B. Joy, from Packard Motor, gave some land over, and in 1917, July of 1917, we started flying airplanes at this little swampland area out next to Lake St. Clair. Uh, it, 
Selfridge has been a continually operating military airfield for 100 years since that date. Absolutely amazing in history if you look at what was going on uh, through the times. Today, Selfridge has grown quite a bit. Uh, about two thirds of the land sits under the uh, elevation of the lake. So we've actually built up berms through the years and it's like big sump pumps out there. We're sort of like Amsterdam. Uh, we've kind of recovered some of this land so that it could be nice and usable out here. Uh, but a very large facility um, is basically a former Air Force base that is now run by the Air National Guard. There is nothing like this in the United States. I get to wear two very distinct hats in my job. I get to be the wing commander of International Guard Wing, but I also then get to be the host commander of Selfridge Air National Guard Base with the many wonderful things that go on there. The base itself is huge. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. We're our own small city. Uh, from roads to buildings to infrastructure uh, to uh, environmental issues, you name it, the same types of things that you all deal with all the time, we get to deal with out there at Selfridge also. But for this group, one of the big takeaways is that last bullet that's up there right now, it's a foot stomper, is when you look at the aggregate overall economic impact of your Selfridge Air National Guard base to this local economy, about $850 million a year. With the 4,500 people and all the different stuff that's going on out there, it's a big part of uh, Southeast Michigan and Michigan as a whole, and it's a regional asset that I'll touch on a little bit more. What we like to call Team Selfridge, our 44 tenant organizations that we have out there, every single branch of the military has equities out at Selfridge Air National Guard Base. We have two marine organizations. We have the Regional Navy uh, Reserve Center that's out there. Um, have Army, a lot of the TARDEC and TACOM laboratories reside out at Selfridge. Uh, there's just so many wonderful things that go on. The only commissary in the entire state of Michigan is there. One of the things I find fascinating, I got to do a tour again this last week, is the Starbase program. I, I could sit and talk to you for hours on each one of these individual things. Starbase teaches STEM education to elementary school kids. It started here in Michigan. Barb Kozak, former NASA astronaut, wanted to reach out to kids at that moment when they were deciding in their lives what they wanted to do when she started this program. There are now 55 of these all around <clears throat> Excuse me, Starbase One here in Michigan. It was the original, it was the first, and it's the best. Uh, but it's amazing to go watch the kids go through this one week curriculum and the things that go on and watch them light up as they're getting to get into robotics when they're into 3D printing, when they're getting to do, they get to fly a space shuttle simulator while they're out there. A, a Mars rover. Uh, there's some really fantastic things that go on. We have some amazing equity partners out there. DHS, we have the Coast Guard, we have the Air and Marine Wing, we have the Customs and Border Patrol, we have the Regional Headquarters. You get the point. A lot that goes on out there at Selfridge. National Guard itself, you know, most people think, and I just showed you a video of one little small part of what most people know us for in the National Guard, and that's the fact that we fight our nation's wars. We get a lot of money from the federal government to be able to fight our nation's wars. That's what we do. But we have two other primary jobs as part of the National Guard. One is we are domestic first responders. We work for the governor. When you hear we talk about call out the National Guard, that's exactly what we do. We are domestic first responders, both for the state and for the region. For example, when the water crisis happened up in Flint, I bet you probably didn't know that your Selfridge Air National Guard base was actually the water distribution center for the federal efforts that went on in Flint. They set up, basically brought all the water in there. We set up what I like to call the aircraft carrier, where all the water came in, we marshaled it out, sent it up where it needed to be. But it was an integral part of the domestic operations for a crisis that happened in our local area. That's what we do in your National Guard. The other thing we do is we build enduring partnerships. We have formal uh, state partnership program uh, relations with countries of Latvia and Liberia, where we constantly have people over working with those so that, you know, it's like any crisis, you wanna make sure that you're familiar, you have somebody on speed dial, you know who they are. When the, the uh, Russians invaded Crimea, that was a big deal over in the Baltic. So our Latvian allies, uh, the president of Latvia picked up the phone and he made a phone call. Not to the President of the United States, not to the Department of Defense, not to the Department of State, but to Greg Vadney. Greg, they were friends. Uh, so he called the Adjutant General of the State of Michigan and said, help me, Greg. But those are the types of things that we do is to build those relationships, to build those partnerships. So we have the war fighting that we do, we build partnerships, and we are domestic first responders. And those are the three primary things that we at the Air National Guard, or at the National Guard, 
do for the region and for our country. Now we're a unique animal. If somebody asks me right now, who is my commander in chief? My answer to you is the governor of the state of Michigan. You heard me throw the quote out a little bit earlier about uh, Article 1, Section 8, how we're a constitutionally established militia for the state of Michigan. And there are 54 states and territories that have National Guard organizations underneath them. We get most of our money to prepare to do the warfighting mission, but we do these other things with what we call dual use being able to put people into different types of statuses and be able to pay them in different ways to do these different things. Now, at any given time, we can get called up to federal service. Whenever we leave the continental U.S. or in a number of other missions, we step over to the federal side and we become Title X warriors that are just part of the United States Air Force and it's seamless and you would never know that we're any different than the active duty Air Force. And then we step back into our state status, back to being part of the Michigan National Guard. We seamlessly go back and forth all the time, and I constantly have people that are in a federal status out there at Selfridge. This summer, I had more than 150 people who deployed for what we call agile combat support. It wasn't my A-10s, it wasn't my tankers. These were finance people. These were logistics, uh, security forces, chaplains, this type of stuff all around the world. And we're just now getting them back. So a lot of our hometown heroes are just getting back here to the United States in time for Christmas. Uh, but it's kind of a unique arrangement. I always like to point out, by the way, did you notice that Trump has a new official photo? So I call this the happy Trump photo because the other one was the grumpy Trump photo. <laughs> nice to have a happy Trump photo up there now. But Selfridge was unique when it started out. Like I said, it was swampland. When we started out, it was called Selfridge Field or Joy Field initially and then Selfridge Field because in World War II, you didn't need runways. Prop airplanes, literally, you parked your airplanes, you looked out there, hey, let's take off that way across the field today, and off you went. Uh, and that's exactly what Selfridge was until the advent of the jet engine when we had to build runways and everything else. So Selfridge Field adapted. Well, there's actually the field itself. What a great look that is, right against Lake St. Clair. Uh, you can see where the airplanes would park, but then it was just a big open field. Rest through time, obviously, we build runways. We've adapted to where we are today, which is an exceptionally large military installation, should I say, it's the last major military installation in the state of Michigan, which is a foot stomper. Is this cutting in and out still? Test. Um, but Selfridge today wants a sprawling facility, uh, a lot of stuff that's going on out there. I love this photo because it talks about the historic perspective of Selfridge. If you look at the top, that was 1931. That's a tri-motor, and those are biplanes. And they're sitting out there as an organization posing for a photo. If you look down below, that's our wing last year with our A-10s and our KC-135s. Please notice, those are the same buildings. So we were recreating that photo uh, you know, for our 100th anniversary that we just had. Now, if you look closely at the top, and only because I have OCD and I'm very proud about it, if you look on the right, the shadows go to the left. If you look on the left, the shadows go to the right, and the people in the middle have no shadows. But that's just one of those little details you notice on those old photos when they put them together. Uh, but it just gives you kind of a framework of the, historic, the history that we have out at Selfridge. Known as the land of the generals, there's been more than 100 very famous generals through the years that have called Selfridge uh, Air Base, Joy Field, uh, Selfridge Air National Guard Base home. It's absolutely an amazing rich history that we have. And like I said, we're the last major military installation in the state. These are all bases that have closed. Last time I looked, now this is a couple years ago, so don't quote me on this, but uh, Michigan was 49th out of 50 states in per capita DOD spending. So what is the defense industry as part of Michigan? Let's phrase it in a positive way. There's a lot of growth opportunity here. There's a lot of things that we can leverage, I think, going forward because we have a, an amazing infrastructure in this state that I'm going to go ahead and continue to talk about here. To begin with, when I talked about the domestic response, all right, that we work for the governor, well, if you think about a Katrina type of an event, we have capacity, 
and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the facilities. We have wonderful men and women who work for us who have a job to be domestic responders, but I have 44 partner organizations that also bring unique talent sets and unique resources for anything that might happen in this local area. We are sitting on major lines of communication on a major installation with great people, with wonderful friends and partners all around. We are a fantastic place in case anything ever happens, a regional response center here at Selfridge Air National Guard Base. When FEMA Region 5 showed up here when the Flint water crisis was happening and they were looking around Selfridge, it was like, wow. And that's exactly what we provide is the wow factor of what we can do for this state and for this region. So why does Selfridge really matter uh, to you all? Okay, it sits over there in Macomb County, sits against Lake St. Clair, kind of quiet at the end of M59 out there, a Hall Road. Uh, but there are some unique things. We have our sister wing organization over at Battle Creek who's into the RPA mission, which a lot of people errantly refer to as drones, okay, but remotely piloted aircraft. Uh, they're into a command and control, and they're about to set up a cyber squadron over there. As you head up to the north, we have Camp Grayling, which is a massive complex uh, that does a lot of training for the Army but has an air-to-ground range where they have people who sit on the ground who work with our close air support folks. We go up there and fly missions. Alpena that sits up in the north, uh, a wonderful uh, training center. And then over the top of that is some amazing airspace. And I have another slide that I'll show you just to give you an idea of the expanse of that. But the fighter mission that comes out of Selfridge, so our A-10 attack aircraft that we have now or whatever future mission, is what actually provides a lot of the support that goes into Camp Grayling, that utilizes that airspace, that works with Alpena. This is the sinew that keeps all this tied together. So when we talk about the missions here at Selfridge, it has statewide equities from an economic standpoint uh, in terms of tying everything that we're trying to do together. We also have a great growth opportunity out there at Selfridge when we talk about capacity, and I'll hit on that just a little bit more. But real quick, I'm gonna kinda go into a part of a discussion we had because if you haven't heard, we're on a short list for this new aircraft to be assigned called the F-35. You've seen something about that in the paper, heard something recently about that. Well, let me tell you some of the pillars and why I think this is a no-brainer. Excuse me. One is we have absolutely amazing men and women who are part of our organization. Uh, just last year, 2016, SPAT Trophy being the best flying organization in the Air National Guard. There's 90. We're the best out of 90. Two weeks later, we got the Meritorious Unit Award, only the third guard wing in history ever to win that award for doing work that we do. Uh, so it's absolutely amazing. That's just some of the examples uh, of the men and women that we have out there and what they're capable of. My organization, we have about 1,800 folks there, but the part that I really want to footstop to you is the, the part in red. Uh, it's 55% because I have a bunch of civilians who work out there, but militarily in the Guard, 70% of our employees are part-time employees. When we say we're a community-based force, that's exactly what we are. I've been out before work, uh, visiting some organizations, some of the manufacturers, somebody lifts a mask, go, hi, I work in your fuel shop, I'm Bill. And it's like, okay. Uh, in other words, our folks working in the community, they're part-time with us. We get to borrow them from you. And one of the neat things here, I'll throw the bottom one is, how many of them actually live in Oakland County? All right, the base might be there at Selfridge, might be in Macomb County. But we have folks who live all over in the region and have a big part. These are residents here in Oakland County who are part of your hometown Air Force, who have to figure out how to balance a life now that includes work, family, and the National Guard, and anything else that they want to do. It's amazing that they do this out of volunteerism. Now, most people think of the military and you think, oh, they tell stuff, there's a chain of command and we order folks. Well, it's a little bit different in the Air National Guard or in the National Guard because these are volunteers. You know, you don't treat them very well, they're gonna walk, they're gonna do something else. So we're kind of a unique organization is what I call an ask, don't task, sell, don't tell. Uh, we're gonna talk about why we do things. We motivate people the right way. So from a military perspective, we're a little bit different and that's good and that's on purpose. So when we talk about the National Guard, you see this logo a lot of times, it's the Minuteman. And it goes back to uh, Concord when they would basically say, your job is to go out and be a farmer. If we give you the call, if somebody hollers, you grab your rifle, you go out and you do your nation's business. When you're done with that, you put the rifle down, you pick up the plowshare and you go back to work. The idea of the citizen soldier. A lot of times we look at that and we don't quite get it. That's what the Minuteman looks like today. There are some amazing men and women who are out there that are doing things in our community. 
I have a medical group. I have a deployable hospital out there. None of them are full-time employees. These are doctors, nurses, public health people and everything who are working in our hospitals providing who also then provide this capability for our state and nation for what we do. Uh, once again, that life balance part of that, the, the citizen airmen is amazing. Selfridge itself has a lot of capacity. Uh, we have a lot of buildings, we have a lot of ramp space, we have a lot of things that we can do, hangar space. We can park hundreds and hundreds of airplanes out there. When they talk about how many F-35s could you park, it was like, uh, all of them. Um, I mean, we really do have that kind of space out there at Selfridge. So if we had like a Katrina type event, parking big airplanes and all is not a problem. We have capacity, but most importantly, what we offer is growth for defense industry. And I'm going to hit on that a little bit more as if in the future uh, or in this presentation. Uh, but there's also been a lot of investment that's going on. In the lower right corner is a midpoint picture of a $35 million new fuel storage and distribution system that's just now getting finished up that should be operational in February that gives us the ability to much safer deliver fuel to the base, store it, put it into our aircraft much more efficiently, uh, and certainly a lot safer. Um, we are just now starting down a path where we're getting the design money where the Air Force is going to invest $80 million in our aircraft maintenance facilities out there. Are we going to have a future in flying airplanes at Selfridge? It's looking that way. We also run our own airfield, which is unique in the Guard. Most Air National Guard organizations sit on an international or a municipal airport, and they share it with a, uh, you know, the civilians or the general aviation. Not the case at Selfridge. Once again, we're a unique animal. So we run our own airfield. We manage it. We can manage what's called encroachment, problems, uh, environmental issues on the airfield. We have a lot of control of our own destiny that a lot of National Guard bases don't, which gives us, once again, a lot of flexibility from an operational and a long-term management perspective. I told you I'd talk a little bit more about the airspace. If you've ever watched movies or watched the military, you hear about the red flag exercises and Nevada and the huge airspace they have out there and all these things that they do, all the super secret Area 51 sits in the middle of the Nellis Ranges and everything else, so all the little green men running around out there. I can neither confirm nor deny. Um, but that's the Nellis complex there in orange. We're bigger. We have more capacity than the nation's top airspace, as they like to tout it a lot of times. We have the Grayling Range Complex, where you can do close air support. They have entire towns and villages built out there. We go up every single day and practice our warfighting mission. The Army does all sorts. It's a wonderful facility with lots going on. We have an overwater bombing range. We have mobile threat emitters. We can go supersonic out over the lake. We can do all sorts of, we can do 100% of the F-35 training in one place. And there's only one place in the United States that can say that, and that's right here in Michigan. It's absolutely amazing the things that uh, we have here in this state. We also have an awesome community, a lot of great community support. Sir, you gave us a letter of support for the F-35. That was huge. This is a big part of what we're doing is to, to build that community coalition. Uh, Mark Hackle's been great from, community count, or from uh, Macomb County. They're helping us in a lot of different ways, but across the board, there's two of the five bases that are under consideration for the F-35 that have very active, we don't want them here, community efforts going on. Here in southeastern Michigan, I'm going to jinx myself, I'll knock on the table, we have yet to have even a single letter to the editor of a newspaper that I've seen anywhere that's been against what we're trying to do here. Uh, because what the F-35 will bring to us is going to be long-term stability, that $850 million a year. When I showed up here three years ago, Selfridge is going to close and the A-10s are going to go away. That was the mantra. Now the narrative is, the next 100 years are going to be awesome. Watch this. All right, we're putting the money in there, we're getting the new missions, we're going forward, and Selfridge is going to be part of this community for the next 100 years. Our missions today that we have, I showed you that, that video there at the beginning. Those are our A-10s. They do amazing work, but we also have the big workhorse, the enabler of all things in the United States Air Force, the KC-135. These are flying gas tanks. These things go around, you don't do any mission without getting aerial refueling. If we go overseas, it takes aerial refueling. Our A-10s have about two and a half to three hours of gas. Our average mission when we were deployed over in Iraq and Syria was about eight hours long. So you take off, you air refuel. You go to a bad guy line, you air refuel. You attack, you come back, you air refuel. You attack, you come back, you air refuel. Come home, air refuel, <coughs> and then you land. So these transportation 
aircraft, these uh, aerial tankers, are the enablers that make everything happen. And they are the highest in-demand mission set in the United States Air Force. Tankers were built in 1956. The last people to fly these airplanes, their parents haven't been born yet. Kind of think about that in terms of the plans. These planes not only are old, but they're going to be around for a very long time. It's a great mission. It's in a high demand mission. And the men and women that do it, once again, are absolutely amazing. All right, we're talking to business people. You can understand this a little bit. The Air National Guard, being part-time organization, being part of the community, being able to flex to that need and everything else, we provide about one-third of the capability of the United States Air Force on less than 10% of the budget. Is that not a value to America or what? If we have somebody who's going to be flying for the Air Force and we're going to invest millions of dollars to make them a great pilot, and they're going to go, you know what, I'm going to go to the airlines now. You know what, you can do that but you can still stay and contribute to the U.S. military. We can hold on to that investment, that talent that we've invested in, that capability that we have as part of our National Guard. So our hometown Air Force, our hometown military, the National Guard, has got to be the best value that we get for our tax bucks. All right, so if you get the chance to tell the story about the National Guard, we are a great value for America. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world. I don't have to tell you all. You look in the news. I uh, have to remind our folks every now and then. It's a very, very serious business that we're in, and we take it very seriously. Uh, there's probably some of that stuff in that tape that you look at and you go, ooh, that's kind of makes you a little uncomfortable. Well, as long as we're continuing to have that fight overseas, we're winning. When we haven't start fight that here on our shores or in our country, that's when we're going to be losing. So we're doing the th right things. We're doing sending our folks over prepared to take care of our nation's business. But back to the F-35, what matters for us? And this is exactly what I told the team when they were here to assess us. We have the people, we have the place, we have the readiness, we have the community. We are the great option, low cost, most capable of the wonderful Air National Guard that you have placed to put the F-35s. If you ask my opinion, it is an absolute no-brainer that this is the right thing to do in the right place at the right time. I had to put this picture up here. It doesn't fit into my talk at all, but isn't that just a cool picture? And I put it up <laughs> for our 100th anniversary. We had a 100th anniversary this year, 1917, 2017. We had a little air show out at Selfridge, if you all were part of that. 235,000 of our closest friends came out for a little bit of a party. We had another 100,000 people on 22,000 boats on the lake watching and more than 1.2 million people who watched on streaming TV uh, what was going on out there at Selfridge. We took one airplane, got a one-year disposition to paint it in a non-standard way. We got to paint it like a heritage. That squadron has history that goes back to D-Day. Those are D-Day stripes. They are the Red Devils. That's the Red Devil on the side of the airplane. It's a very nice-looking plane, but this is what we do every day. There it is up over Mackinac Island, Mackinac Bridge, being air refueled by one of our KC-135s. I kind of want to tie it up just a little bit um, and open it up for questions on your uh, for you. But this picture, yeah, it's kind of a cool picture, but it actually represents way more than what you can see just by looking at it. Uh, this was in 2015. This was over northern Iraq near the Syria border. That is a Michigan A-10 with a Michigan pilot sitting on the wing of a Michigan KC-135 with a Michigan crew taking the fight to the bad guys it was a straight Michigan fight. Um, but it was just kind of a unique, here we are teaming together, our citizen airmen and soldiers together overseas, making it all happen. So that being said, what's on your minds? What questions do you have? Yes, sir. Thank you for your service. Nine Eleven and Selfridge. I wasn't there. Okay, uh, I've been here for three years, but what I can tell you is they were flying F-16s at the time. Um, when Nine Eleven happened, obviously it was a surprise. Uh, most bases, uh, we just train on a day to day. We're not in a war fighting uh, footing here in the United States. Selfridge was doing their F-16 training and all at the time. Once again, one of the unique things is we actually happen to be the regional weapon storage area. Uh, so it was very easy when Selfridge got the call to bring in their citizen airmen plus their full-timers and it stood up an alert mission 
that didn't exist before. So they were actually flying combat air patrols over the United States within 24 hours here out of Selfridge when that event happened. When I was down in Arizona, we did the same thing. We just didn't happen to have any munitions nearby, so we were the munition for about three weeks uh, in that particular case. But that was Selfridge's role is they stood up right away into that domestic response homeland defense mission. Uh, not what they were prepared for, but that's what they answered the call for. Ma'am. What are some of the other communities that are vying for the F-35 is the question. That's a great one. There's five. All right. Jacksonville, Florida, Alabama. I don't remember which city in Alabama. I think it's Montgomery, Alabama. Um, Madison, Wisconsin, and Boise, Idaho, and us. All right. And the two communities that have the pretty big anti-F-35 are Boise, Idaho, and Madison, Wisconsin. Um, so, I getting that right, James? Look over at our <laughs> Senate staff. <laughs> Senator Peters has been great on this effort, by the way. Uh, two of them are F-16 bases, two of them are A-10 bases, and one is an F-15 base. So there's a lot of interesting discussions going on back in D.C. What's the future of the different fleets? What about the basing criteria? I think that we're probably going to hear something before Christmas. Don't quote me on that one. That's just me and a guess. Maybe into, 20, uh, into the next year. Uh, just because of the holiday season, once they do make a decision after briefing Congress and everything else, but I'm hoping General, good news. Yes. I have a question. First of all, um, as a, I visit uh, Selfridge once a year, Vietnam veteran, Army, but I love your beautiful roundabout that you put at the entrance, and I know that you were responsible. And why I say that is I'm chairman of the Road Commission for Oakland County, and we think it's a great idea. Great, and you know what? I actually thought I had a picture of that in there on one of my slides. Maybe I did in the infrastructure and didn't notice it, but that's a great thing because it makes me want to bring up the P4 stuff. What he's talking about, one of the jobs that I had in DC, I was actually the head of the Department of Defense Motor Vehicle Safety Task Force. Innocuous title, traffic safety. So when I first time I ever pulled up to Selfridge on the outside, if you've ever been in the front gate of Selfridge, it was a three-way stop intersection. And I remember pulling up to that and looking at the traffic and everything going on, and, pardon my French, I went, Oh, hell no. I called it the triangle of death because there were multiple deaths there every year. There was serious issues. I mean, the way it was designed made people do stupid human tricks it, it, bad. But started working with our county and the local townships. It's half federal land, half county land. We put half federal money, half county money, worked the uh, contracts through the county because they could do it at half the cost and half the time. And within 18 months, we built a roundabout. So now you don't even stop going onto that base or onto the major freeways. And now if there's any bumping of uh, automobiles, it's same day, same way, and people don't get hurt. But it's a great story of partnerships and all there, which leads me into, we now have, as the laws continue to evolve, there are now what we call P4 initiative, private-public partnership opportunities that didn't exist before. There are things that we can do. And once again, I could go into tons of examples. There's a lot of housing that was closed down by BRAC of 2005. There's an organization that's coming out there that's teaming with veterans. They basically want to set up a traumatic brain injury transition center, refurbish a lot of those old historic houses to the historic standards, use it for short-term housing for our veterans, work with the Eisenhower Center in town for the medical treatment. How is this not just a win-win across the board for everybody? I've uh, been working it for three years since I've been here. We haven't quite got it across the finish line yet through the government red tape. But there's a wonderful things like that, possibilities now with industry, with government affiliations that we can do for growth opportunities. And there's going to be a forum for that on the 28th of April, I believe it is. I can get you information on that one. If ways that your businesses can partner with Selfridge or even end up being one of the tenants out there as part of our Team Selfridge Alliance. For, we're going to take for the F-35? The question was, who makes the call on whether we get the F-35? And the answer is the Secretary of the Air Force. She alone is the final decision maker on it all. Now, her dad used to be a crew chief at Selfridge. I'm not saying we have an in or anything else. <laughs> I hope she likes her dad. Um, but no, she's been, since uh, Heather Wilson's been in the office, former representative in there, uh, I think is very reasonable. Uh, and prudent in terms of making the decisions. When the basing first went to her, they gave her a briefing on the basing criteria, and she essentially said, no, you need to go do a little homework and come back to me later. Uh, so the whole thing has kind of slid to the right on a timeline, but ultimately, sir, there's going to be uh, the decision makers of the Air Force. She is the one that has the hammer on, yay, nay, or otherwise. Yes. By the way, tell me when I'm out of time. All right, just, yeah. Yes. 
Thank you, uh, hey General. It's uh, your Michigan's Air Force. Can you bomb Ohio State? Uh, no, seriously, uh, the economic fallout, uh, or excuse me, the benefit from a comb is obvious. Can you talk a little bit about the economic benefit for Oakland? The economic benefit of the F-35? Uh, yes, yeah, so at the base for, for Oakland County. For Oakland County. Well, one is, like I said, you, the fact that we are a viable organization has direct benefits out there. When we talk about the F-35 coming in, yes, there are some aerospace uh, implications for that. It'll be an operational unit. Uh, but the biggest thing it really is going to do, it's going to cement Selfridge as that $850 million a year economic impact and uh, defense growth opportunities that are out there right now. So it really gives us stability more than anything else, as opposed to there's going to be some huge growth. But as I told you, one example of that with the Enduring is you know, $80 million of construction that's going to be going into uh, some of the facilities, and that's just one example. Uh, of the things going on out there. So yes, it's got a very positive economic impact across the board, uh, and it's region-wide. It's nothing that's isolated to Macomb County at all. Just like our people living everywhere, that economic impact of contracting goes across the board. Yes? Question, what, what, what was your career path fast-forwarding from high school? You know, when I was in college, the buzzword, deferment, to try to avoid getting into the service. How old do you think I am? Well, well you know, but it would be interesting to know your career path from high school. Career path from high school is what the question is. What my career path from high school. Um, I knew I always wanted to be a pilot. Believe it or not, I actually wanted to be in the Navy. Uh, but I had a better chance of getting an Air Force scholarship in college. So I went through Air Force ROTC. I ended up in a three and a half year scholarship. I wanted to fly big airplanes around the world. Uh, based on the rating I got in pilot training and all, it just took me on a different path. Uh, when anybody asks me a question like that, most of the time I say is, I never ever would have picked the path of my career that's ended up where I'm doing what I'm doing right now. Every path, everything I chose would have been different. I was going to the airlines right up until the first Gulf War. And then all of a sudden, none of the airlines were hiring. So back I went into the military side of things. Uh, I thought I was going back to DC, my job before here, that I was gonna be a Beltway bandit uh, doing jobs back there. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, we need a leadership up here. We need a wing commander. And it's not different. They don't transfer me. I applied for, interviewed for, and was selected for this job. I quit the Arizona National Guard. I quit being on active duty, and I joined Michigan. So when people say, are you stationed here? No, I am a Michigander. All right, so um, that was kind of the career path. It's never what anything that I destined. It's when opportunities open themselves up and just taking advantage of it. Yeah, General, we have time for one question, and I'm going to take it because I don't see any hands running up. Okay. What's the one position that you have the most difficult time filling on your base? That's actually a great question, by the way. There's always job opportunities. I have over 150, between 150 and 200 opportunities uh, of different types out there, mainly for part-time folks, and you name the occupation, it's there. The hardest ones we actually have had fill because it's changed over time. For a while, we were critically low on pilots. That has been one of our big efforts all along, if you haven't heard of the airlines hiring and everything else, but we've actually been very successful in that, and come next summer, we're actually gonna be back up to 100% on pilots. I need folks who actually, uh, munitions and avionics specialists, so folks who know how to work with electronics and everything, uh, and then people who like to work with uh, bombs, bullets, and guns and that type of stuff, you know, those deranged people. Um, no, but it's actually a great, tactile career field where you can learn quite a bit. So those are probably the two biggest areas that we the, have recruiting Do those jobs require a college degree? They do not, not the uh, avionic. And the cool thing is, if we hire folks, we train them. Uh, there's a state tuition assistance program that's absolutely amazing, the amount of money. So somebody who's in college can come out, join, get an education paid for, also get skill sets, get that experience, and at the end of the four or six years, and they go, this isn't for me, Salute, thank you very much, appreciate your service. Now you have an education, now you have whatever, uh, and off they go. So there's a lot of mutual benefit to when folks work for the National Guard, uh, the training and the opportunities, the education, those types of things. There's a lot of synergies back and forth between us and the community. Uh, so if they have anybody that's interested, uh, well, once again, I think it's beneficial. I don't need to even sell it if you come out and see what it offers. Because our young, one of our youngest Elite 40s is here, I'm gonna let him ask the last question, actually. Are you gonna do it with a deck of cards? Oh, it's not an ec economic question, but uh, it, you were alluding to kind of the toughness of maybe some, watching some of the videos. So in your, it, with Selfridge Air Force, do you get any mental people who are mental health or 
at something have you ever experienced with insight? Ready and healthy is, is that. Okay, resiliency is the term that we use for that. Caring for people is one of our big objectives in everything that we do. And I happen to know the background with you're talking with suicide prevention and everything else. We have a uh, family readiness center. We have a airman wellness center that I have a director of psychological health. We have trained professionals. We have medical professionals. Uh, we have uh, sexual assault response folks. We have equal opportunity. All those, we have an entire team of people whose job it is is to make sure our people are taken care of. Um, for the most part, what we find on our side is people get more resilient the more time they spend in the National Guard and when they deploy. It's a little different. The Army side, when you think PTSD and everything else, we actually have an opposite metric from that is people get more connectivity, they have more friends and stuff like that that are closer from the times that they deploy. So we, from a statistical standpoint, on the Air National Guard side, kind of flip that narrative the other way. It actually helps our people to deploy and be part of all of that. Uh, but there's always issues. Most of the folks in my organization that have problems, it's money problems and it's relational problems at home, not stuff at work. Uh, it's not the PTSD type of stuff that you would think about in the news and all. It's what happens to everybody are the same types of issues that we deal with. And we have a team of professionals, wonderful professionals that help take care of that. If you want to partner with us, let me know. We'll figure out ways to get you involved. That would be awesome. All right. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here today. I uh, appreciate it. It's very informative. One of our best uh, roundtable speakers. I, he must know that we grade them from year to year, and that was pretty sly to work in a uh, video of Ronald Reagan. So, <laughs> is there anything we can do? On for the site, or is it too late to write letters? Or age of players out here. James, do we need anything else at this point? Let's talk to Senator Peter's staff, who's been absolutely awesome. I think we're all set and prepped and everything. Uh, you can write letters to our congressmen all day long, but they're all on board. So all you're going to do is motivate them, and they're going to go, yeah, baby, choir, choir, at this point. Um, so no, I don't think there's anything else you can help keep tabs. There's the MIF35.org website that we helped uh, send information out. Uh, so if there is a call to action, that's how we're going to reach out to people. Hey, well, well thank you for joining us this morning. Very informative. Well, you don't need to speak yet, Mike. I'm just getting you ready. So, uh, we are at the point of our agenda that turns into a more informal uh, discussion. For those that were here last year, it worked out pretty well. We had a really robust panel discussion last year. Took us on a lot of topics, gave us a lot of directions. But this is also the time where the bathrooms are out through the door to the right. Uh, there's more coffee in the back. Don't be shy if you need to stand up any of those things, or if you've got a business meeting, Brooks always says, make sure the primary purpose is getting you out into the world to go make money on behalf of Oakland County. So if you need to sneak out, uh, it won't offend us in the slightest. Um, but we're going to jump right in, if that's okay with my panel. I'm just going to have you sit right here and not move up to the chairs on the stage. It's a little more comfortable, I think, with notes and, and what you can do. So uh, you noticed in your, your book that there's a joint recommendation this year. In 25 years, we've never had a joint recommendation before, uh, and it's a very unique one. And Mike Cooper, who is the chair uh, of the Economic Development Committee, has been the champion of that this year. And Mike, tell us what that is. Um, sure. So as we um, in economic development started out the year, um, we started to talk about the issues that we felt were critical in economic development. So. You know, we talked about obsolete properties, and we talked about asset management, um, county assets, the importance of, of properly inventorying those assets, of managing those assets so that they can um, work for all of us. You know, we talked about manufacturing, we talked about education, um, skill trades, you know, the way that we can help our businesses, the way that we can help our students, the way that we can help our workers who are in need of retraining um, in order to better support um, our communities here. Um, and as those discussions continued, it was, um, it was clear there were some common themes there. Um, it, the county is doing terrific things. We are wonderful at getting things done and have a track record of doing that. And I think that's really indicative of the kind of leadership we have here. Um, but we really felt like that, that we would benefit from a comprehensive and coordinated communication and PR strategy. 
a focused and targeted campaign, if you will. Um, and then we get together in October, the leaders of the five roundtable committees, um, and we're talking about sort of where our heads are at and the direction our committees are going. Um, and it was clear that, that the committees were of a similar mind. Um, they were talking about the work that they were doing, their own perspectives as they relate individually to their committees. But again, it was coming back to, we're doing great things, but how do we get the word out? What, you know, how can we get a comprehensive, a coordinated, targeted um, strategy for communications and PR? Um, we talked about regional competition. We talked about the changing environment. Um, but while the environment is changing, the position of Oakland County as a leader in our region is not changing. So we talked about the importance of proper positioning so we maintain that position that we have. Um, we talked about the benefit of getting some outside help, some people who are schooled in, in expertise, um, an expert in, in building these kinds of campaigns and telling these kinds of stories, and the importance of providing resources, funding and such, to make that happen. Um, we talked about the power of consensus. Uh, Matt talked about um, that this doesn't happen um, all the time, that there is um, this kind of consensus among the committees. We talked about how wonderful it was, and we talked about the importance of a complete story, a complete Oakland County story. Um, and, and any story has to have, you know, aspects of quality of life and what we provide for families for generations here in the county. We have to talk about transportation, mobility, safety, technology. Um, we have to talk about workforce and education. We were built on that, it's our future, and we, we want to talk about that. Um, next Oakland, the next generation, the entrepreneurial spirit um, that is hitting us, how do we maintain that, how do we foster that? And then of course economic development and, and providing an environment where we can all thrive, our businesses, our communities. Um, so we ended up in a place where we said, you know, there is, there is a common theme, there is a place that we all feel um, the county can go that would help all of us, that would help all aspects. Um, and that was, that was, again, what we've talked about, comprehensive and coordinated communication and PR strategy. Um, we talked about the goals of this kind of thing. We're all in this, we all believe in it, um, connecting all aspects of the county. Um, for a focused and dynamic message. You know, General Slocum talked about tying things together. Um, he talked about regionalism. We believe the same thing. Um, we need a dynamic message. We need to connect all aspects of the county. The county is not only economic development. It isn't only transportation. All of those things working together make this a very powerful place, a very attractive place. Um, that's our power. Um, that's our competitive advantage. And we want to make sure um, that we're making those connections. Um, how do we convey the brand of Oakland County? Um, we're doing great things, but do people outside of the county, outside of our region, know we're doing great things? I think they do, but I don't think they know enough about what we're doing. I don't think they know um, the substance of what we're doing, and we have to make sure we're telling them that and sharing that information, not just around the state of Michigan, but nationally. We've got a lot of people who would benefit from engaging with, uh, with us here in Michigan. We have to make sure they know our story. Um, we need to attract new business here, and we have to do it while effectively maintaining the business that's already here. We have to continue to build a great environment for them, and we have to invite new people into the fold. And then we have to attract residents of all generations. We have so much to offer the residents, the citizens of the area. We've got to make sure that people know it, that we're celebrating it, that we're sharing that. Um, and and I, I'll, I'll echo something that Matt said, it is not typical for the business roundtable to offer a joint recommendation. I think we're fortunate to have really, really great, talented, passionate, committed people participating in the business roundtable. They're, they're involved in this. Um, and I think we're really proud to be sitting here today offering this on behalf of the full roundtable, not because of the words or what it says in the book, but really because of the profound positive impact we think this can have on our community and on all of us. So a question for Jennifer, if you could pass the mic down. I apologize to um, our august chairs, but you'll be passing the mic back and forth. So Jennifer, Mike's talking about his communication. Uh, your committee, Quality of Life, has had ambassadors in the past, and that was part of your recommendation, and we started that program, and quite frankly, it's kind of fizzled a little bit, at least in my perspective. So what's your thoughts about communication and how you tried it with creating brand ambassadors, and what's the Quality of Life thoughts on this communication question? It seems to me that as we talk about quality of life, everybody has a story. The question that we have to wrestle with is, 
whose story do we pick up? We knew from working with other groups, Silver Tsunami was a major issue, and that became something that we've worked with since 2010. Um, there are other issues that have to deal with um, other, other parts of Oakland County, and frankly, where we've had our most success is when we focus on something that Oakland County already has a staff department for. If you're talking about a health issue as quality of life, who better to talk to than Kathy Forsley? If you're talking about economic development, who better to talk to than Irene Spanos and her team? And as we have done that and worked with the things that we hear, because we're all in different jobs, we all hear different things, that's how we've done it. I, I guess Dan Hunter would know more about the ambassador program as it was. It was an economic development uh, focus, and there are still people who, even though they may not wear their little pin, um, do feel that that's their job when they're out in their regular workaday world. Um, there's no better way than talking to somebody who lives here or just started a business here. Than, to, than there's no better way to know what's going on. What's been interesting for me in the years that I've worked with it is how much the county has already picked up on that. The variety of staff services that are available through Oakland County's own staff is amazing. I, I continue to be surprised that, oh, that's been doing, that's what they've been doing. That's what we could use in our work. My suggestion is all of you take on the role of being a business ambassador, but first, pay attention to what Oakland County is doing and talk to the people who work in those departments. You'd be, you'd be impressed. I've been impressed. And um, the county here is here represented by many, many people. Find out who they are and go find out if your issue can be dealt with by somebody in that community. So Jennifer raises a, a, a interesting point, maybe she didn't realize it, that, that she said, well, I didn't realize they were already doing that. And that seems to be a dialogue at times. And so I'm standing next to Megan, pick on her, but I, I pick on people. You That's do what pick I do. on me, Matt. You I, know you pick, pick on me. people, right? So Megan, you're part of our Oakland Next, and, and how do you get your communication? Like when you want to learn about something going on in the world, how do you get that information? So she's holding up two cell phones. So we had a program of ambassadors that went out and in person communicated and never really were always informed of up to date on a regular basis of, of what are the programs we're doing. Like how many people know what walk-in startup Thursday is? Right, a few of you do. Well staff of course, Dan, of course you know, All right? So who knows that, um, that uh, you know, Jennifer Llewellyn, I think she had to take off, but you know, who knows how to explain to access skill worker training funds? Not that you have to be an expert, but at least you like know who to go to. How would we, how would we communicate that? Greg, I'll pick on you. So how, how would we better get you informed as to the types of programs that are happening on a daily basis? How do we get that information to you? Social media? Right. Tony, what would you say? What's the best way of communicating information to a group like this or a group like anybody else? I think, you know, anytime you can pull groups together that are, have like, like um, common interest. The Aerospace Industry Association of Michigan, that's a group of aerospace companies, talent and access to talent, talent development is critical to that. So sitting down with those groups that are already getting together to talk about how they're going to solve solve the talent crisis is a great access to those those. We're really going to go out on a limb now and pick on our good intern. He's done great work for us in, in Medical Main Street. So, Maddie, how do you get your information, or would you even care to get this information? I guess I ask you both of those questions. Depending on what career I go to, it could probably email. Oh, sorry, this mic is going in and out. But uh, she said if it's relevant to her career, she would be interested in the information. 
you've had a long career, right? So, so how do we reach the, the young people? Mike, have you given any thought to that, like in the joint recommendation, as to what would be the implementable tools that your committee and others might think of? Well, I think as you, as you go around the room, it, 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 pretty quick to realize that there isn't one right answer here. Um, if we're going to reach a large number of people, if we're going to reach the whole of the community, there's going to be several portals, several communication protocols that we're going to utilize. And, and one of the reasons why we felt that perhaps engaging an outside expert um, was important in helping us to develop a campaign is exactly what you're talking about. You know, you've got to you've got to develop and deliver the correct story. So we have to talk about what are the important issues um, for the county, the key ones to talk about, and then we have to deliver those messages the right way. So the targeted audience, the people who get that, um, are the ones. So you know, you're talking about social media, um, email. Certainly, you're going to use those portals. Um, you're going to use more conventional portals as well. You know. Um, and I, and I think maybe one of the one of the, the the benchmarks examples you might look at is the Pure Michigan campaign. It's something that we talked about. It was a campaign that was developed to really build the brand of Michigan um, here and, and nationally. And I think if you look at that, um, you see a, a variety of, of communication of portals and conduits being used. You see email. You see social media. You see physical billboards. You see printed material. You see all kinds of things. You see panel discussions and presentations. And I think what we would be looking at. Um, um, if we were to engage somebody to come in as somebody who could help us, we know what our message is and we know who we want to reach. The big question is, what is the most effective way to reach those people? Lots of choices. All of them take resources. All of them take uh, money and such. Let's make sure we make the right choices. We do the right thing. But for me, it, it's not a which one do you use. It's the way that you take advantage of all of the opportunities in front of us and use them most effectively. I'm going to ask Susan something next, but while the mic's passing down, you had some thoughts? Yeah. Well, one of the ways that has been effective, uh, uh, one of the ways that's been effective um, in communicating those inf that, that information from um, the county side with all of the resources and services that the county present um, as it relates to economic development or, as you just stated, the one stop. Uh, startup shop uh, down at the county was to, we launched a campaign to identify um, potential entrepreneurs, already um, business owners that might need um, certain services or resources. It was a campaign, like you said, to strategize or create a strategy to recruit these persons and to get them connected to the resources at the county level. So it was a little bit of strategy, um, like you said, a campaign, but to identify those persons and to put things attractive to attract them to um, the resources, and that's been very effective to incorporate them into that process. And we find that in the Pontiac uh, demographic, um, there's a cutoff of information um, as far as it relates to the county and its resources that can help young entrepreneurs or uh, developing businesses in the Pontiac community. And so we've been able to connect them to the county through our effective communications levels, whether it's social media, or getting out in the community, knocking on doors, or hosting uh, business affairs, et cetera, to get really the information out that allows businesses in Pontiac to grow and develop. So that's been an effective measure that we've been able to use or utilize to be able to bring um, new business or potential or inspiring entrepreneurs to uh, connect county resources. So it sounds like it's a lot of hands-on. It's that filling that gap with a lot of hands-on uh, information. I had always thought that we could start, but an ad that I would love to do with you, Brooks, is I'd love to wrap a classic car with like a, uh, a Michigan postcard from like the 50s. Remember those old travel postcards, you know, uh, wrap like a you know classic GTO and have the hood up and then pan around and there's Brooks Patterson saying, I'm just working on the engine that runs this thing. That'd be a great way to brag that we're out of the engine that runs Michigan, right? That'd be kind of a cute way to do it. Susan, as uh, Kruger is uh, the co-chair of our Oakland Next Committee, it's the new committee from last year, and we've got started, I see Nadja is here as well, uh, that co-chair of the committee. So we've gotten started with Oakland Next, spreading the word, but on the question of communication, I'll admit that we've, we've struggled a little bit, right, of trying to define that. So tell the group a little bit about Oakland Next, where you're at, and how you're trying to attack the communication question. 
Okay, very good. Uh, we see this as a three-tier approach. Um, definitely the first time we all met as a group, I think I shared this last year, that we all agreed um, none of us were all that familiar with all the wonderful resources that are available here in Oakland County until we were tapped on the shoulder to somehow get involved. And um, we agreed that needed to be a number one priority. So our approach has been a combination of um, live events, social media, and then what we're referring to as resources, which is um, trying to be a central hub that pulls together a lot of resources to help young people in Oakland County get connected to opportunities that might be relevant to them. So the live events involve um, going out into schools. Um, we did our very first one at Lake Orion High School. That was in March of this year. It was a, a massive success. Uh, we have a waiting list now of people who are looking to host a live event. So um, it's a matter of getting our resources coordinated to get the next one going. Um, but we are planning to scale that up um, so we can reach students and pass our message along of what's available to them here in the county. I think one of the greatest assets that we had at that live event was um, an army of volunteers from the Oakland Roundtable who were in uh, orange t-shirts. I think that really communicated to the students that there is a community of people out there that really want to help them. And then, of course, social media is something that is um, a, a vehicle we can use, our bottleneck at this point is just matching our strategies or our desired um, objectives and strategies as a group with what uh, a government organization can support, so that still has to be ironed out a bit. But we see the two, those two pieces in particular really feeding one another, that we can build some social media traction with our live events, and that our live events can um, you know, help make this make what we do through social media more personal connection for the the young people that we're trying to reach so by show of hands who uses instagram S snapchat those are the two most popular ways of communicating to a person under 30 years old so 22 year olds don't usually use facebook that's for grandma and grandpa that's you, Dan Hunter. You're a grandpa, right? Almost. Almost a grandpa, right? Yeah, I'm not there yet, thank God. Uh, so who uses Facebook in the room? Yeah, a lot of us use Facebook, right? Who communicates, their principal communication is by email? In 2010, Benoit College had a study that um, they interview hundreds, you know, they're up to like 2,000 kids every year that they interview. Uh, and incoming freshmen coming not only into Benoit College, but to other colleges around the country, and they call it the Benoit College Study. Not a very creative name, but it's a very important study. I'd encourage you to Google it. Every year they come out with this study. The freshmen coming into the class give their perspective of what they believe the world will be when they graduate in four years. One, I'm, I'm amazed, and Pete, you'd probably be amazed too, that they have faith that all of those kids will graduate in four years, because that doesn't seem to be the trend these days. Um, but pretend they would graduate in four years. In 2010, that group's number one theme was they felt email was the new snail mail. They didn't perceive ever using that in their business life. So those students now are four years into presumably their professional career, that was eight years ago. If you ask someone that is 26 years old, which would be their average age, how do you communicate as your principal form of communication? Who thinks they say email? As you're kidding the hint, Fred, you think they say email. A few of them would, I'm sure. Most of them will say text message. Most of them will say some type of social media. If you work in China, you'll say WeChat. If you work in other parts of the world, there's different social media tools. I bring all of this up as part of the work has been is understanding the next dynamic of who this group is, but also who the county is. And that's what Susan, Nadja, and Megan, and I saw Jennifer was here, and others from the Oakland Next Committee are, are trying to work on. So let's change gears a little bit from communication because what Mike's talking about is, is telling the story of what we do. Jennifer related to, um, okay, this is, this is, we have all these programs and sometimes we don't realize they're happening. So we have walk-in startup Thursday. We have, uh, we brought in the million cups from the Kauffman Foundation for entrepreneurial pitch uh, competitions. I bet you most of you don't know that we're doing that, that I think it's like every Thursday or something like that. Irene, every Wednesday, 
Every Wednesday morning, we bring in entrepreneurs to pitch, seeking potential partnership, seeking potential capital every Wednesday morning. So if you're an ambassador for Oakland County, who knew that? See? We have to do a better job, and that's the question of communication. But switching gears to things that we also need to do in addition. So, um, uh, Alan, you haven't talked yet, which is a miracle. You did give me inspiration for the beard, though. So, <laughs> Alan, talk about distracted driving, some of the new topics that your committee has taken on. No, this is Alan, Alan Kirillick. I'll get to you next, Sowers. You said distracted driving. I thought, okay, I have the wrong name. <laughs> that's you, huh? <laughs> So I know that the Transportation Committee has always has said funding, 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 and I know that's important. I'm sure Eric and the gang would agree, but what's been the work on some of the new topics, distracted driving, some of the driverless stuff that you've talked about this year? Well, um, we, we are uh, really uh, focused and, and distressed on uh, the lack of progress on uh, distracted driving. So much like we've already been talking about, the dis we feel that the, the distracted driving issue should have a campaign, kind of like Mothers for Drunk Drivers would, you know, and so forth. Something has to be done to, to inform people of the risks and hazards. And then, of course, it becomes legislative and it becomes technology. And clearly, uh, the prospects are, for example, you hear from some, some attorneys that they're going to be out of business with the connected vehicle because of the radical, the anticipated radical reduction on injuries and, and collisions to, to tech, the connected car. So we are very sensitized about, about the distracted driver issue in all in various aspects. We're very sensitized about the uh, pedestrian and safety issues. We don't feel that, uh, uh, that, that there's just this inherent uh, sensitivity and on our leaderships in the various municipalities and or in Lansing that we are addressing the sensitivity of pedestrians, bicycles, um, and so forth. And we just don't have road designs that are, are responsible or responsive to these concerns. So we are very much into the funding issue. I mean, the real dilemma, I mean, uh, it doesn't seem to be moving the needle in the state, and that is sensitivity to uh, uh, funding, capital funding. I mean, we're like 45th, excuse me, we're like 45th in the nation for capital uh, per, on the roads, capital per, per, uh, per capita uh, expenditures. I mean, that's outrageous. And you know, you're talking, you want to have connected car, but you don't want to spend money on roads. I mean, we have, we have some serious issues, but it comes down to safety and it comes into the technology. And the other challenge is that we're kind of really trying to get out there is it who do we need to attract and how do we uh, offer leadership for th uh, the technology that's five and ten years out because it's just in its infancy and it's unimaginable what is expected in the future and we have to get it in place and make sure that that this infrastructure is a, in a leadership role here in the county i'm going to walk over and pick, pick on our good superintendent of uh, oakland school and have her comment well, you know I was going to pick on you eventually. I have her comment upon what Mr. Kirillik just said, is the preparation of workforce, of students that are getting into an idea of we need to fix roads, we need to have safe roads, we also need to have this advanced technology. So from your perspective, um, you know, what's the county, what are we thinking of in terms of that young student that hears this and might think that is the most boring thing I've ever heard? No offense but kids might think that. Um, but from your perspective as, as the leader of our, of our schools. Picking on me this morning. And, and I will get you. I will get you. But we are, in fact, this is my team here with me. I have the fellow who's in charge of all instruction in Oakland County, our new career technical director, and our supervisor here because we take this very seriously. And what we have to do is to start early. We have to expose our students to the various occupations and that there are several roads that they can take. This past summer, we offered a STEM camp where we brought in over 600 middle schoolers because we're preparing the farm club. You gotta prepare the bench. When I get them, as the system stands now, I don't get them till 11th and 12th grade. That's a little late. 
However, last year we did give you 17 pre-apprentices into the field. But we can do more, but I need everyone in this room to help. We need partnerships, we need opportunities. So with that, I think we can do more. Alan, we've got it. The reason I, I interjected with the workforce question in transportation, and I'll get to Mr. Sowers in a minute. You know, we've got a, an interesting situation going on. So if I turn to my friends at the Road Commission, they would say we need infrastructure funding for traditional roads. We need to lay asphalt, we need to repair bridges, we need to improve our basic infrastructure. But what, what Wanda might be saying is that a ninth grader or an eleventh grader is not thinking about a career in replacing asphalt, no offense guys, um, but they would be thinking of a career in transportation and mobility. And so what's been the dialogue on your committee is to that whole kind of transference of what we're thinking as a round table, how we don't forget about the fact we have to fill potholes, but we look to the future, that transportation. Well, really what we're wrestling with is how do we, uh, what, what do we bring into the perspective in terms of the infrastructure. Infrastructure is just not asphalt and concrete in a stoplight, but it is all the connective and communicative aspects of the, the electronic and technology infrastructure that we need everywhere. We need the speed, uh, we need the infrastructure, and the question also becomes how do we pay for it? The county can't just keep writing the checks, right, Bruxy? And so, you know, so how do you have a plan that encourages private sector capital investment to benefit the county and perhaps make money for the county, right? Make money for the county, that would be good, wouldn't hey. it? Yeah. But so what he's alluding to is, and I did see uh, Fred Nader and some others on, on the Road Commission that helped us, is our RFP and connected mobility is a business model that allows us to monetize the spectrum that's used for connectivity between a car and traffic signalization and, and, and infrastructure. Uh, the RFP would allow us to pilot that and to prove that we're right, that you can look at the bandwidth, which is the same type of bandwidth that your phone works on, and create a monetized value. That would create revenue into a public-private partnership that would presumably pay for the infrastructure. We all want red lights to tell us not to go through the red light. I'm sure my boss would have loved that uh, more than five years ago uh, if the knucklehead that pulled in front of him would have been compelled to be warned or stopped. That technology now exists. Can we as a county accelerate the way that we're going to use it, create revenue um, in addition, uh, which is great. So, you know, this whole advancement of technology, Al Sowers, I'm going to pick on you now from the Workforce um, uh, and Education Committee, but from your perspective at Kelly Services, you know, what is the direction of our workforce really going? I mean, what, what are the challenges we face or what are the opportunities we face just in a general sense of workforce? I know the committee, once again, and I always chuckle to my Workforce and Education Committee friends, you always have the same recommendation, at least one part, which is, Please support workforce development. So um, hopefully we'll continue to do that, boss. We'll support workforce development. But from a, you know, looking out into the future from your perspective or from the committee's perspective, you know, what's the challenge and opportunity right now? Thank you, Matt. Uh, quite a bit of challenge, uh, but significant opportunity. And, and that's where we're really uh, honing in on is what's, what's available tomorrow? What is the opportunity for our workforce tomorrow? And, you know, when I, when I take a look at that, and I'm just going to kind of tie it back to Oakland County here in a bit, and, I, and what Mike has shared, uh, the critical aspect of that is having a tra talent attraction story. And so part of this joint recommendation is, is exactly that, creating a brand, creating a message, creating a campaign for the county. All right, there has to be a destination. Uh, at Kelly Services, we're constantly looking at the pivotal jobs, the jobs pivot. What does that mean? The jobs today, how are they going to pivot in the future too, and what are they going to go to? Um, it, you know, we probably sat back about three, four years ago, and we couldn't imagine being able to access mobility via an, via an app or our smartphones. Now, Uber is huge. Um, one of the challenges when you go to a, a grocery store, or this time of year to any retail store, is it's a fun shopping experience until you get to the cashier line and the checkout line, and you're 10, 15 people deep. And so now Amazon is addressing that by just walking in, activating your app, your phone, right, and going in, selecting your items, and walking out. So those are the jobs that we need and we're looking to be prepared for. Robotics, robotics 
associated with manufacturing. Now we're looking at bot technology in the office environment. How are we going to, how are we going to put bots in place to do the work people do today? We're estimating about 28 to 30 percent of reduction in our current workforce, the people that we have skilled in the jobs today, pivoting in some fashion because of bot technology. Clearly that's going to take education, right? So Absolutely. you saw I sidled up next to Doug Smith over here. So Doug, your perspectives on this question, you're at OCC now, you used to be in, in, in my role, have extensive experience on both ends, bringing the businesses in but now developing the, the talent behind it. So your thoughts on it? Well, uh, I think one is we've got to be, the education sector has to be more collaborative. We've got to be more collaborative between the colleges, the four-year institutions, but particularly with the K-12 system. That seamless work together. But one of the things that I think hasn't happened in workforce development is you got three parties that do development. Um, education, and, and by that I mean K-12 and community college and four-year, public-private, two-year, four-year. Um, companies themselves do a lot of training, and so do the unions. And at some point, we need to get all three together to talk about how we can better collaborate. And the other issue is I think we've got to have a much better um, interaction between the private sector, companies, and education so that we do things right the first time in the sense that really doing, when I talk with my, my faculty at, at OCC about um, working with short-term training, um, and the value of that is that we can attract students one of the great opportunities we have in education is one of the, the second largest problem you have in the private sector behind not having skilled trades is having retirements. Well, those people that are retiring are a wealth of opportunity for us to bring them back into the classroom and find a way to make that m much easier to do so that we can do that. But when I get to collaborative curriculum development, my faculty oftentimes would turn me off. And that's really where we have to be. We have to get together with business and industry so that we're doing as much training as business and industry is so that that's some of the solutions. I think the other opportunity, and, and Al talked a little bit about opportunities that we have is one of the big issues we've got is a tsunami in unemployment and retail. Those people are gonna be, you know, ought to be a target for us in education to retrain that skill set or train that skill set to take jobs that we have that we don't have enough of right now. Yeah, if you look at our hot jobs list, which we've, we're going to start publishing as part of the Oakland Next initiative, uh, in the top five most demand unfilled jobs is retail, and in the top seven is supervisors of retail. And so it is a very, very important sector, and as you're saying, it's pivoting, it's, it's transitioning. So I asked the, the general, you know, what's his toughest job? And he gave, gave us pretty advanced sounding jobs, didn't he? Uh, and I said, well, does it require a college degree? It doesn't. And that's no, you know, sorry, Pete. And, I, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a multiplicity of ways we get there. So who here has a job that they can't seem to fill? Anybody experienced that? They have a job that they can't seem to fill? Make my old knees work here. Make sure they can hear you. We have a difficult time finding caregivers, the elderly in the home. Very difficult, uh, challenging situation. It needs some training. It's not uh, difficult to learn the types of things that these people do in the home, and a lot of them have done it already if they had kids. So uh, not, not difficult to train them. I'd just like to say that uh, along with all of the skills that people need, I think a lot of people need to remember the importance of working. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an interesting one too, right? So. Who else has a job that they increasingly find difficult to fill? I'm going to answer a question in a minute anyway. Let me pass. My husband and I bought out his partner recently for a small manufacturing company. It's in Wayne County. Most of his employees live in Oakland County. And the ones that he wants to replace that are moving on to something else have to know basic math and some algebra. They need to know how to answer the telephone. They need to be trainable in the particulars of the welding industry. 
and we cannot find people to replace one of our people who left recently, finished his college degree with my husband's company's help, and he's gone, and there's nobody that knows how to run the darn CNC machines. I mean, we have looked so far forward into, into electronics, so far forward into um, an age bracket with Oakland Next, that the issues that are right in front of us right now, like the population aging and the, the need for manufacturing to go into the next generation, the next century, um, are having a hard time because we're looking past the immediate to get to the future, which has all kinds of implications. So we've had a question over the last five to seven years about we need more training. Um, Doug, do we need more training programs? Probably not. I mean, we have 63 apprentice programs in the apprentice guide we put out this year. Your school has how many training programs? Too many to count, right? You don't even know the number off the top of your head. We've got uh, the Oakland Tech Centers are wonderful. The, the campuses in Pontiac and Royal Oak and other ways. Uh, kids almost have a waiting list. I know out in Lake Orion where I am, there's a waiting list to get into those centers. So we don't necessarily need more training centers. Now that's just my opinion. I'm one person here as part of the group. But what it seems to be is we, we need people. We need enrollment. We need more kids at the, te the technical centers. We need more people that can be trained. And it certainly seems like that's part of the situation we're in. Our unemployment rate's now down, hovering at 3% for almost a year. And we're at the highest participation rate that we've been at since 2001. And we're going into 2018. And our population, while it's growing, certainly declined substantially. Uh, or not for us, but in the region it did. For Oakland County, pretty much stabilized. And so it might be a people uh, question. But to transition while we have just a, a little bit more time, we don't want to keep you too late. Uh, uh, as we can. Jennifer, that's why I wanted you to keep the mic. So transitioning from workforce uh, into some recommendations that Quality of Life had because it's a whole other approach to let's not forget about some things. And so tell us a little bit about Phragmites or base of species or types of things that your quality of life kind of took on as a dialogue. It's part of your recommendation um, uh, that also enhances who we are as a county with Phragmites, it's the, it's the scourge of the earth, but it's affecting municipal budgets because it is such a widespread um, problem and so expensive and it's a three-year project whether you've got a three by three square or you've got a whole lakefront. And it's, I, this group does not represent this, this thinking, but volunteers have always held the world together. And they're the ones who see the problem of the Phragmites, for instance, and they form organizations. All volunteer. They need the technical knowledge and they get those from the professionals, but people these days don't have as much time to be a volunteer. So the problem gets way ahead of us on a lot of these things. And in our case, there is a group that has organized and been very effective, and one of our members, a long-term member of the group, has hooked up with them, and they've got a plan, and now Oakland County, thank you, thank you, thank you, has stepped up and said, we want to be behind that because we see the impact on the communities, and it's only getting worse. Drive through any water area, which is Oakland County, and you know what I'm talking about. But without the volunteers, to do that, it would never have, it never had seen the light of day. And if there's one thing I can say to all these people here, and I've said it to Leadership Oakland, you know how you earn your living. You know that your kids need you at the soccer game. But is there something else that you can do as a volunteer? Might even lead to a second career. But that's all quality of life, is that connectivity between all of us in the church we go to, or the PTA we join, or the Phragmites Control Group, please volunteer. Help our economic development with what you do. But quality of life starts for many issues with volunteers. Well, your other recommendation was regarding recycling. So tell us a little bit about the, the thought the committee had on that. 
Cycling was one of those volunteer issues um, in Clarkston, where I come from. Um, it was called Bottles for Building, started by one woman, I don't know, probably 40 years ago. Now it's something that we all say we do, but we only do it when somebody makes it possible for us to do it. And Oakland County now is going to work with us and with a couple of people on our committee to see if the county itself can't recycle its own waste. Start with plastic bottles, and they already, some, some do, some don't, already recycle a lot of paper, but there's more to be done, and it, if it, it has to start at home. So I'm, I'm glad that Oakland County has said, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do about recycling. Then it'll go to the municipalities. Then it'll filter down. But it hasn't grown much as a program within our county and others. It hasn't grown much in the last 30 years. It came with a bang, and it's just sort of stable now. In the meantime, we're throwing away more and more and more, and it's costing us a lot of money to throw it away. It'd be better off to spend the money on recycling, and you'll hear more about that in the next year. So who knows where all the recycling centers are and the programs in your neighborhood? In Jim, of course, and everybody. Kind of full circle back to the communication. So who knows about NOHAS in Oakland County? You run the program. Um, so no has is something that came from this roundtable, a recommendation of how to deal with household hazardous waste. Uh, we run no has events throughout the county. The most recent one was out in Lake Orion, and there was, what, 1,700 people came or something like that? Um, you have the ability to drop off your household hazardous waste. You can drop off your paints and your oils and all of those things. Um, but I ask a group like this that's so engaged with us, do you know about that? And not many of you do. It circles back, Michael, to your initial recommendation, which is we need to communicate better uh, for those people. Jennifer, it's recycling. There's recycling programs that are available. Are we communicating those better? So, you know, next year is going to be spent a little bit in, in communication um, and, and dealing with that. I know Irene has been very active in working. You know, one thing our staff does is as you make recommendations throughout the year, we just go ahead and get started on them. So we kind of knew this one was coming, so she's already knee deep or maybe waist deep in, in coordinating the opportunity, whether we're going to do it or whether we're gonna partner with, um, with the state uh, through their PR firm in Birmingham. Um, so working on that diligently. So hopefully by the time you start meeting after the first of the year, you'll be like, holy moly, you already started. That's our goal uh, going forward. So just some final thoughts from, from the room. We're gonna talk about just two things. I always like to people, my staff knows, you know, what's a challenge that's facing you that you can't seem to overcome right now? Uh, those are the types of things that we like to tackle. So is anybody facing a challenge in their business or in their community uh, that, that they'd like to share that they just can't overcome? And if you don't, then it's great. But uh, I know there's some challenges in business and community. There always is. Gene, you have a thought? I'll come right back to you. You don't? You sure? You've been on this thing since the beginning. You don't have any? You have lots of thoughts. Now, of course you do. Here. One of the challenges we I've been facing at um, American Unity, we're headquarters in Pontiac, is the soft skills in that demographic. It's pretty tough, and so the resources and partnerships are valuable to pretty much develop a workforce sustainable there in Pontiac. So that's been one of the toughest issues: is the soft skills and the lack of education. Everybody knows what soft skills are, right? We hear over and over. I know Irene and Dan and I do, and Jennifer and everybody else is, is we'll train them if they show up on time, right? And that's what we're talking about is basic soft skills. The very first skills needs assessment that we did, John Albstead's in the back, when John through Workforce did the very first skills needs assessment, um, that was one of the number one issues um, in the skills needs assessment was we need soft skills, and soft skills are really mainly defined as you can do basic math and you can show up on time and you can dress appropriately and you can work in an, an environment with other teammates, those types of things. We continue to still have that challenge. Does anybody else have a challenge in their business, Kathleen? Wow. Oh. oh, there I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, because we sit on Workforce and Education Committee. 
Okay, I'll just keep it here. Uh, we've expedited a 501c3 called the Grassroots Environmental Action Team Foundation that is going to address the uh, workforce needs through inviting uh, different organizations, including educators, uh, community colleges, universities, to the schools themselves, to the middle schools. What my concern is, is finding ways to get that all logistically together. And so when you talked about volunteers, Jennifer, I'm, I'd like to talk uh, to anybody who's interested in getting involved in that program. We're looking at getting funding started this month or next month uh, through CIA, I believe, in Birmingham. So we're excited about that, but if you are interested in really addressing the skills trades need, um, So any other challenges? Everybody's doing so well. They hire everybody. Greg, you, everybody's good. Everybody shows up on time. Books are good. Everything's good. I don't know of any classes is act communications, both written and spoke. Business of people around the world you, you won't ever meet, and they have to form a con, uh, an opinion based on what they hear or what they read. That's lacking today. Second is a lot of really cool, neat, appropriate things can happen. A lot of times they're hatched by unknown folks, but they have to get to the right people. They need to perfect the elevator pitch over the phone because that's the door that you want to open. And I think that's lacking today, and I see that day in and day out. All right, so here's my last question. I promise it's the last one. I'm looking at the clock, and I'm not going to look at Brooks. He's probably got the eyeballs on me right now. i got to wrap this up, kid. So last question. 25 years of the business roundtable, we've done a pretty darn good job. You've got nearly 800 recommendations. Brooks is right as we go through them. Um, this coming year, my staff has already been given the challenge is that we will be producing um, a kind of a celebratory book of the history of this roundtable, the challenges that it's undertook, the success that it is, so that the, all, the question, I don't see Joanne Van Tassel here right now, but she would be saying, so what have we done? What have we implemented? And could you please tell us? The idea is that we're going to do that exercise. Dan's grumbling inside, but we're going to do that exercise because it's a huge exercise to take on what have we done with these nearly 800 recommendations? But that's the first 25 years. So what's the next 25 years look like? And we've talked as the chairs about this topic in our mid-year meeting. Alan, you want to start that? We'll pass the mic down to you. I got it. Thank you. Um, you know, I really challenge everybody to think about if you if you view technology as you see it today you, you know the trains left the station we really have to step it up if we really want to be a leader in, in the future of society in this country the other thing is that that i just would challenge everybody to be thinking about here is that when we are in this marketing campaign and we need to make sure people understand the infrastructure the county offers the educational system offers but you know, if you're going to bring new people into this, if you want new employers, you gotta ask yourself, you know, we're a state that is basically, at best, flat line with population. So yeah, I'd like to know how you're going to attract 1,000 or 2,000 or, or a major job employer into the region when you're at 3%. What are you going to do? What are you going to offer them? For you? The companies, in reality, follow employees. So aside from education, which is critical in, in early education, uh, which is an, of immense importance, is that this marketing campaign, in my opinion, has got to be uh, have a strategy. Is How are we going to bring new population in? We really need new people that already have skills, and that's no disrespect to the people that we're trying to educate and bring up in, society, in life. So that's my bottom line, is it? If we're gonna stay at 3%, I don't know how you can attract new employers. And, and you're not going to long-term, because the employers are gonna follow the workforce. 
That, that is always the first question we're asked. Is not what's the tax tax incentive, it's what's the workforce and can you there deliver you the workforce? Are there other thoughts from the committee, Mike or Susan or Al or anybody, about the question of what does the round table look like in the next 25 years? What do we do this year to position ourselves um, going forward? Well, one of the things that I know is a, a stake in the ground for Oakland County is the number of international companies that are here represented in Oakland County. And one of the things that we discussed as a group a couple months ago is that we don't really have much representation or any representation that I know of from the international companies here uh, with the Business Roundtable. So I think if that's our, our major unique identifier as we move forward, especially as Detroit starts to pull some things, more and more things together, I think that should be a top priority for us is to figure out how to get their representation with this organization. Thanks to the great work in places like Auburn Hills, uh, Bohong sounds like it's moving forward, and that's yet another Chinese company to add. It's pushing us towards 1,100 now multinational foreign-owned uh, companies, and so it's an excellent point. Al, do you have a thought on what's the next step we take as a roundtable to continue this momentum? Yeah, so just a, maybe a thought or two, and, and I'll capitalize a little bit on what Doug shared earlier, but uh, when you're a successful county, or Oakland County, you're the rabbit to catch. And, and that's been that way for a number of years, uh, thanks to the leadership of the county and, and, and the businesses and community. Uh, so the next 25 years has to be focused on how is that rabbit, do you stay out in front? And because and you, you don't want to be caught, right? And so a lot of the things, the projects that went into uh, uh, the wonderful display uh, to, to the, your left, my right of the room, uh, we've got to re-energize, I think, the committees to say, we're meeting as, as a team, but now how do we take this external? How do we involve, and this is where Doug's thoughts come in, how do we involve the business community? How do we involve the unions? How do we involve the educators together to move forward as an organization, as a county? Almost as if we need to have a recruitment effort for new faces new identities, new ideas, not replaceable faces, but new faces within the round table. Mike, your thoughts? Um, yeah, you know, I want to piggyback something that Jennifer talked about. She talked about the importance of volunteerism. And um, one thing that I have, have noticed and am keenly aware of since being involved in the round table, it's driven by volunteerism. Um, for the most part, we don't get paid to do it. We, um, we do it, and I think, for, for three reasons. One, um, there's purpose. There, there's an important purpose to the round table and, and it, it feels good to be part of it. Um, second, um, benefit. We benefit, there are networking opportunities, there are opportunities for us as individuals and business people to benefit from our engagement in the round table. And third is impact. Um, we know that there is impact. Matt talked about the importance of highlighting and capturing what the impact has been, but we know there's been impact. It will help to have it on display for us, but we know it's there. And as I look at a changing business climate, as an evolving world and maybe a smaller um, business world, um, we have to go back, in my opinion, to purpose, benefit, and impact. We may have to um, redefine these terms as they exist today. Um, I think the business roundtable was built on these principles. I think the future um, will be based on these principles. Um, and I think um, a little bit like we saw this year, the, the committees working together, collaborating more so that we perhaps offer less recommendations, but larger, more impactful ones um, that we can work on together. I think there's a bright future. I think we just may have to redefine ourselves as it relates to the world in which we're doing business. So we're, oh, this one's a lot louder. So here, Brooks, use this one, it's super loud. I just wanna make an announcement that lunch will be served in about a half hour. <laughs> oh my cow. <laughs> you know what, not only do I admire your volunteerism to serve on a committee, but I also admire your patience. Um, General, we have uh, in the past given out gifts and so forth to our speakers and we called one of your aides and they said, um, you're not allowed to accept gifts over $20. I want you to know there's no such limit in Oakland County like that, just in case you're curious. Um, so we also want to know what your favorite restaurant was. And they told us you go to, uh, is it uh, 
Bob Evans. Now this is, is a man of the people, folks. So I can't believe I'm doing this. I have a gift certificate for you for $20, which is your limit, to Bob Evans. <laughs> We're ready. <laughs>